Hello, everyone. Great to have you with us. I hope you're all healthy and well. Welcome to the next talk in our Golden Webinars in Astrophysics series. Our speaker today is Aline Tolstoy, who is a professor of astronomy at the Kapdarin Astronomical Institute of the University of Groningen. My name is Thomas Puzia, and together with Demetra de Chico, we have organized today's webinar for you. As in our previous webinars, we have provided again for simultaneous language interpretation by Mr. Patricia Gonzalez, who is already simultaneously translating for us into Spanish. En sus dispositivos pueden escuchar a señor Gonzalez en la interpretación de español de la conferencia al pinchar el botón de interpretación que se encuentra en la parte inferior derecha de la ventana de la aplicación Zoom y seleccionar español. We would like to acknowledge the generous support of the Center for Astrophysics and Related Technologies, also known as CATA for its Spanish acronym for making this webinar series possible. Thank you so much for all your feedback and comments. If you're watching a recording of this talk on YouTube, please leave your comments below. If you would like to support the Golden Webinar series or give us feedback, please send us an email. If you have any questions during the talk, please type them in the Q&A window. You can also upload questions and comments on them. We will select the best questions for the discussion after the talk. The link to the live version of this video will be automatically taken down by YouTube shortly after the streaming ends. However, the final high resolution version, both in English and in Spanish, will be uploaded in our channel in the next few weeks. Before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce our other panel members that are with us today. So first of all, we have our speaker, Elena Tolstoy, and we have our interpreter, Patricio Gonzalez. There is Thomas Pusia as well, and myself. And then from the Institute of Astrophysics at Book, we have our postdocs, Paula Ronco, Yasna Ordenes, and Paul Eigenthaler. We also have the great pleasure to welcoming our guest panelists who are with us today. Anna Genina, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Max Planck Institute of Astrophysics in Garching. Kati Vivas, who is an astronomer at the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Jacqueline Farangorkom, who is a professor of astronomy at the Department of Astronomy at Columbia University in New York. Søren Larsen, who is associate professor of astrophysics at Radboud University in the Netherlands. Mike bonin Colchin, professor of astrophysics at the Department of Astronomy at the University of Texas at Austin. And Mario Abadi, who is a professor of astronomy at the Astronomical Observatory of the National University of Córdoba in Argentina. And last but not least, we have our excellent Q&A manager, Ricardo Acevedo, who will be sorting through the questions and comments for us today. So it is our great pleasure to introduce Elina Tolstoy as our golden webinar speaker today. Elina got her bachelor degree at the University of Edinburgh in 1988 her doctoral at the University of Leiden and her PhD in 1995 at the University of Groningen. In the following years, she was a postdoc associated, associated with major observatories. She was first an ESA postdoctoral fellow in Garching for two years, then ESO postdoctoral fellow from 1998 to 2000, always in Garching. And the following year, she was a Gemini support scientist at Oxford University. In 2001, she joined Captain Astronomical Institute in Groningen as a Royal Netherlands Academy Fellow. Then five years later, she became associate professor there. And since 2011, she's full professor there. Elina's research is centered on understanding the formation and evolution of resolved stellar population in dwarf galaxies, with the aim of shedding light on galaxy formation and evolution processes throughout the universe. She has authored several key papers in this area, and since 2011, she has been an associate editor for the top scientific journal, Astronomy and Astrophysics. Elina was awarded Pastor Smith's Prize for Astronomical Research in the Netherlands in 2007 and the George Darwin Lectureship granted by the UK Royal Astronomical Society in 2013. She is the project scientist and Dutch PI of MICADO, that is the multi-adaptive optics imaging camera for deep observations, which is being built for the ESO Extremely Large Telescope expected to see first light in three to four years. So we now hand it over to Elina, who will tell us about fossils of galaxy formation, faint dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm surprised you found all this information about me. First of all, it is a tremendous honor to be here and to be giving this talk. 
uh, and to be able to present some of my results to such a large number of people in Chile and perhaps in the world. Chile is a beautiful country and a key location for any astronomer. And every astronomer is completely in awe of all the facilities that there are in Chile. And I am an observational astronomer. And so over the years, I've uh, come to use all the wonderful optical telescopes that are to be found in the Atacama Desert, starting with uh, the VLT on Paranal, and also the La Silla, and then of course, uh, Tololo, Las Campanas, and I hope to be using the ELT in the not too distant future. These are really outstanding facilities, all of them, and I've made tremendous use of many of them, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do so and the opportunity to tell you a bit about some of the research, which has primarily come from the VLT. The other telescope that I use extensively in my work, have used extensively, is the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a slightly unusual picture in that the telescope is being refurbished, it's being fixed, and one of the, astron one of the astronauts who came up at the time was Claude Nicolier, and he took this wonderful picture of Chile from space. And he did this with a, with a nice feeling in his heart because he also started his astronomy days working at observatories in Chile. So Chile really has a tremendous place in many people's hearts for a place in, or, in which to do astronomy and to observe from incredibly clear skies. Although sometimes you need an even more clear sky and you go to space to get even better image quality without any problems, even from very thin air. So what I'm going to talk about now is, as the title says, I'm going to tell you about the fossil record of galaxies and how this lies in their stars. So how we can use the properties of individual stars to learn tremendous detail about what happened to that galaxy, what happened um, in the past, and how this has affected the properties of the stars. Because in the end, a galaxy is a collection of gas and stars and dust. And effectively, what a galaxy does through time is convert its gas into stars. And this process uh, continues for many giga years and allows you to have a very interesting insight into what has happened in the past all the way back to the earliest times. And stars have these very useful properties of being long lived and maintaining uh, the conditions of the gas clouds at their time of formation in their atmosphere where you can see absorption lines, stellar absorption lines, and measure the chemical abundances that were present at the time the star formed. So you gain this tremendous insight into what has happened in the past by looking at individual stars and building up a picture for a galaxy. And this is not to forget also the power you get from the kinematics, from the way the stars actually move. Uh, you can tell things about the origin of the stars and the gravitational field in which they sit in today and in the past, because stars retain a lot of information about what has been happening in the past. And this is the only way we can actually study stars in our Milky Way. So as the title says, I'm looking around the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way is here in the center, my, my mouse works. So here's the, here's the Milky Way where you see a disc, a pink, a slightly a blue disc, and this is where the Milky Way is. And all the other dots that you see, the red and the blue dots, these are all small dwarf galaxies that are in what we call our local group around the Milky Way. There's also two other large galaxies. There's M31 and M33, which are large disk galaxies, uh, but they are, as you can see, the minority of galaxies in the local group. By far the majority are these red dots, which are small, dwarf spheroidal or dwarf elliptical galaxies. So they are galaxies which are no longer forming stars, but have formed a lot of stars in the past. And the blue diamonds, which is NGC 68, or the small Magellanic cloud or the large Magellanic cloud, which are these two here, they are still forming stars today. They still have gas. And so they're very active systems still today. But again, you can see that around uh, the big galaxies, these are a little bit in the minority. And just to give some nice pictures of what this actually means, here is M31, where you can um, uh, see the disk that is very much like a disk that we believe our Milky Way has as well. And there's also some dwarf galaxies around M31, dwarf elliptical galaxies that can also be seen in this picture. 
the large Magellanic Cloud is a very familiar site probably to many people in Chile, where you can see it with the naked eye. This beautiful, large, irregular, but it's called a dwarf galaxy often, although it's very much a large dwarf galaxy. And then you have tiny, small dwarf galaxies like Tucana, which is all the way on the edge of the local group, very faint, very fuzzy, very old, uh, and you can almost not see it on the sky. And NGC 6822 is this one, and it's still got gas, still forming stars, and the blue that you see here is the gas. The red that you see is star-forming regions, and then the stars are buried in amongst all of this uh, extra young uh, star formation that's on top. And my personal favorite type of galaxy is this one, where you don't almost see anything, but you do see a lot of stars. So all these are individual stars in a very faint system. And this is my absolute favorite dwarf galaxy, Sculptor Dwarf Spheroidal, which uh, is very old. So you don't have any of this mess that you have of young stars forming today. You look directly back to old star formation, to ancient star formation. So now I'm going to show you another ancient object, which is very nearby the, the Milky Way. It's about five kiloparsecs away. So it's very rel it's relatively close. And it's a stellar, stellar system, resolved stars. And you can really see the power of looking inside the system, what you actually see when you have the resolution and the sensitivity to be able to zoom in, in into the center. So it starts out with a ground-based image, and then we're going to transition into a Hubble Space Telescope image as we go deeper and deeper into the center of this stellar system. And you can see that their stars are moving, which means that Hubble images were taken many years apart. And for the first three, you could it's actual real motion. And then a simulation was made to extrapolate this motion to the next 10,000 years. So it can extrapolate to how much these stars move. So you can see this is a very actively moving system that the stars are not in any way stationary if you have the patience to look and wait and see how the system move, how the stars move within the system. And what you can also see very clearly is that there's a very big mixture of types of stars. There are red stars and blue stars and faint stars and bright stars. And this is what you need in order to make this kind of image is the spatial resolution to be able to identify the individual stars and Hubble Space Telescope is outstanding at this. And also the sensitivity, you want to detect the faintest stars and you want to measure the colors and the magnitudes very accurately. And so this is something you can do very nicely in this field. And this very beautiful video has been created by, uh, by astronomers in Baltimore, the Space Telescope Institute to show you how what it means to have red, blue, faint, bright stars by reorganizing this, this image to see where are the blue stars and where are the red stars. And now also where are the bright stars and where are the faint stars. So you have red stars on the right, blue stars on the left, faint stars at the bottom, bright stars at the top. And you have various different types of stars that we know about. And you can see the luminosity and color directions and what we see that all stars basically distribute themselves this way, which is not necessarily something you would know, you would expect a priori. You would think it would be scattered all over this color and luminosity plane. And this is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram because the first people who really made an effort to do this kind of experiment, to see how the distribution of stars with magnitude and color fell in such a, uh, uh, in this observational plane was Hertzsprung and Russell. And they did this more than a hundred years ago, although they did not understand why the stars fell in this uh, distribution in a color and magnitude plane. And this is something that uh, we now do understand. We have understood since a while. And thanks to Hans Bethe, who explained how uh, nuclear fusion works, so how you can actually generate energy in the center of a star by converting helium uh, and uh, hydrogen into heavier elements. And thus you have a tremendous energy source. And the more massive is a star, the faster is the evolution. So what you end up with when you plot the positions of stars in this temperature luminosity plane, which is the physical properties of the star that you're measuring with magnitude and color, if it's a very young system, one, one million years old, it distributes itself like this, okay? And if it's 10 million years old, 
you can see the distribution is slightly different. You're losing the very brightest stars. And as you go to 100 million years, again, the brighter stars are leaving and you're starting to get more and more of these red stars on the right. Okay, and you can go to 1 billion years old and fainter again, and you're starting to pick up a couple of white dwarfs also sitting down here. And then at 10 giga years, this is what it looks like. You have a very much shortened main sequence. So you've lost all the bright stars along here, but you have a distribution that's very red. And this is the reason that old galaxies which don't form any stars are red and young galaxies are blue because of the distribution of the magnitudes and, and colors of stars in this plane. So this is often called the color magnitude diagram as a way of, um, that's the observational properties and then the physical properties to which the observational properties refer are the temperature and the luminosity. Okay. And so what I showed you in these, these little, um, little um, animation was how uh, uh, individual systems of a single age look. And now I've put up this proper color magnitude diagram where I've added up all stars of all ages. So this is a constant star formation for 12 giga years. And what you see with the different colors is where these different sequences of different age stars lie. So a color magnitude diagram that can measure the faintest stars is extremely important and interesting for being able to disentangle all these different age systems within a resolved stellar population like a galaxy. And so if you see gaps or if you see more stars that are faint or more stars that are bright, you can determine, calculate, the star formation rate and how it has changed with time, which is a very powerful insight into what's actually happening in a galaxy. And I make an analogy here with geological layers where you're actually you're hunting back down into the fossils into different layers. And if you look at a star that is in a particular position in this diagram and is in an easily distinguishable position, you know that you're looking at the properties of the galaxy at different ages going back all the way to the oldest times, to the most ancient times, because stars form going back an incredibly long time and low mass stars, which is what you're left with here, are always going to still be there. So stars that are very low mass, lower mass than the sun, whenever they form, they, they don't disappear again. So trying to put this into a perspective of what this looks like in terms of the different stellar types uh, the different masses. This is all very classical for amateur astronomers, especially looking at the different types of stars. This is a strange classification for a range of stars. That was It's a long story, uh, exactly how it came about, but it basically came from an initial lack of understanding of exactly what physical processes were being monitored. And so the stars were A, B, C, D, E, and then they reorganized them and removed some classes and they end up with this logical sequence now, which is a sequence of mass with different types of stars. And what you can see very clearly is the very high mass stars have very short lifetimes, 10 million years. Whereas the very low mass stars can have lifetimes much older than that of the universe. So what this means is any of these stars, these 0.5 to about 0.8 solar mass stars that have formed, unless something happens to them, so they have, uh, they, they have some kind of incident, they, uh, they are still alive today and you can measure their properties and look deep into the heart of the ancient star formation, the first star formation in the universe. So these low mass stars can live a very, very long time. And that gives us an, an amazing insight into the age, into, into processes going all the way back to the beginning of the universe. Because this doesn't mean that a K star is 10, 10 billion years old. It means that K star can live for 10 billion years or hundred billion years. So it means that they will all the all those that have ever formed are still there today. So this allows us to do a kind of cosmology. So it's a very classical diagram of the star formation rate density going back in the way cosmologists usually plot it is this one, the red shift against star formation rate. And then this one is the way a stellar astronomer would do it, look back time. So the age of a star compared with the, the amount of star formation that you see. And the first thing to note is how different are these diagrams. So people perceive the universe perhaps in a slightly different way using a term like redshift compared to using actual time, linear time, whereas this is linear redshift. 
And you can make a very clear um, connection between the different ages of stars that you are able to pick out at these different times. So it means that if you see a very ancient star today, it was formed in the very early universe. At a look back time of 12 giga years, if that's the age of the stars that you're looking at in these different parts of the hertzsprung russell diagram. And you can look, if you look in a different part, if you look at the very young stars, you can then see them there in this part of the color magnitude diagram. So if you see these kind of objects, you know that they were formed very recently. And of course you have the intermediate age, looking at stars that are about one to three giga years, they formed at these intermediate times. And you can actually do the same thing onto a redshift plot. And again, you can see uh, the different way the redshift tells you about ages. So almost all of the evolution in time happens between redshift zero and one or two. Uh, whereas there's a huge redshift range where actually time goes very quickly, uh, if that's the way you're thinking about it. So it's making this connection between the way you look at stars and observe stars in this color magnitude diagram, in this hertzsprung russell diagram, and the way you can tie this to an age and to a, an evolutionary moment or a formation moment in the very early universe. And if you look uh, at any galaxy in the local group, all of these dwarf galaxies, almost many of them have very detailed and very beautiful color magnitude diagrams. This is a nice set of examples from the Hubble Space Telescope where you can see all the different properties that you find by just measuring the color. So this is all in Hubble Space Telescope uh, filters. Uh, so this is, a, this is a luminosity and this is a color in every diagram. And you don't even have to really understand which filters are which to understand that you're looking at very different properties. And what it means, as we've seen from the, what the model of a color magnitude diagram looks, at, looks like, is these galaxies have very different star formation histories. They formed stars at different times. And so you can see, for example, if you look at, um, at Tucana, it has very few blue stars. And if you compare that with Leo A, which has many blue stars, we now know that Leo A has many young stars, whereas Tucana has none. And you can also look at how red is the, is the red giant branch. Some red giant branches are more red than others. And this means that more metals have been produced in this galaxy because this is a more metal rich effect. More iron has been produced in this galaxy. So it means the chemical enrichment processes have gone differently in two different galaxies. And understanding this and putting it together gives you an overview of all the different properties of these small galaxies that are floating around at various different distances from the Milky Way, all of them tracking back to the very earliest times of star formation in the universe. And this is something you can only do in the local group because the further away you go, so these first two panels here are in the local group, Small Magellanic Cloud and Leo A, all of these color magnitude diagrams are observed the best you can do with Hubble Space Telescope and the Advanced Camera for Surveys, the ACS. And what you see is that you get beautiful color magnitude diagrams going down very deep and you're able to see the oldest stars in these systems. But when you go further away, it becomes more and more difficult, partly due to crowding, partly due to distance. So the stars are intrinsically fainter. This is all done on an absolute magnitude scale. So there's a luminosity what you're seeing here. So you can see why it's easier to stick to the local group in order to do this kind of study. But you can also see, although you're restricting yourself in space, you're not necessarily restricting yourself in time because you can really look back uh, in tremendous detail. And this is a very nice uh, comparison with, again, going looking at what cosmologists look, look at. So their, their luminosity functions, how many galaxies they find of different magnitudes uh, in redshift surveys. So when you look in these very deep surveys, what types of objects are you probing? And the most advanced surveys are these Hubble ultra deep fields and the, even JWST will struggle to push down below the most massive dwarf that we know about, the large Magellanic cloud, and won't even touch most of the structure, the substructure that you see within the local group. All these faint galaxies are just not reachable. And even those that are reachable are not very detailed. So this is an example of the illustrious simulation 
but this box is the co-moving size of the local group. So our local group <clears throat> is now very small. Uh, this is redshift zero, this is now. But if you go back in time to redshift three, redshift seven, the universe was much smaller then. So the volume that you're looking at uh, is, is, is changing. And one of the points that this simulation makes and shows graphically very powerfully is that even if you can make an image, a direct image of say a large Magellanic cloud at redshift seven, it's going to be a fuzzy blob. Okay, you're gonna have one point of information. Whereas if you look at the Mag large Magellanic cloud today, you get, or the local group even today, you get much more information about the properties of the ancient stars. You get many more points of reference as what was happening at redshift seven. So there are many reasons to take this approach to try to understand what is happening at the earliest times in these systems. And of course, uh, part of uh, the interest is the local group. So it's not just dwarf galaxies, but also the fact that we live around the Milky Way and trying to understand the connection between the Milky Way and the small dwarf galaxies. And what you see here is a fantastically beautiful picture from Yuri Beletsky from Paranal, where you're actually seeing with a camera just on the, on the platform. This is not taken with either of the, the telescopes on the, of the VLT. This is the disk of the Milky Way that you're seeing spreading all the way across the sky. And here you have the large Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud. I'm always very envious of people who live in the Southern hemisphere, who live in Chile and can see this with the naked eye on any average beautiful night in the Atacama. And this is another example also of the Milky Way at a slightly different time of year, where now you're seeing the very center of the Milky Way, the bulge uh, of the Milky Way. And the disks are out on either side here. And the point here is that you can see is the Milky Way is also made up of individual stars. It's just incredibly difficult to disentangle what is a nearby star that is very faint and what is a far away star that is very bright. Intrinsically, you don't necessarily know uh, which is which. This is where a little bit kinematics come in is that we have known since quite a long time that stars move with different velocities. And the majority of stars sit in the disk and move nicely around the center of the galaxy. But the red dots that you see jumping up and down here are stars which do not follow the nice rotation of the disk of the Milky Way. But these are what have traditionally been called high velocity stars that move in and out of the plane of the Milky Way. And they are basically halo stars. So it's a different component that you can pick out by their velocities, by how fast they are actually moving showing you that their origins, their formation was different from the disk of the Milky Way. And these stars are used typically as a, as a template for a very ancient a metal poor population, a very ancient population, which has undergone, undergone very little chemical enrichment through time. So that's sort of my overview of what you can learn from uh, individual stars, from seeing stars and putting them in color magnitude diagrams, seeing them move in the sky. And the main thrust of my research really is spectroscopy and what you can learn from spectroscopy. And this is incredibly powerful when applied to stars. The first work that was done on this or the first time that somebody saw what was possible, Fraunhofer in 1817 saw for the first time absorption lines in a stellar, in a solar spectrum. So we just disperse the light of the sun through a prism. And if you do this with the reasonable resolution, you see all these dark lines popping up. So that was a, a point of interest, something of note to see that these lines popped up. And then as time went on, people started to make experiments to try to understand what these dark lines are. And Kirchhoff in 1859 or so, published his results at that point, that every chemical element has its own spectral lines. So what you're seeing here is just the result of various chemical elements absorbing the light coming from the center of the sun and leaving behind this dark band in the spectrum. So when they know this, they can then start to look at how much or how, what kind of strengths you have for different types of lines that you found. And so people started, this is what we always do when, we're, when, we're, when we have a new, uh, new uh, piece of information is you make a catalog. So the most famous catalog of stars is this Henry Draper catalog. 
which was a spectroscopic classification of more than 200,000 stars done really by hand by this group, mostly of women at Harvard Observatory. Uh, and they, they did an extraordinary, tremendous work to gain an overview of what were the general properties of a very large number of stars, which allowed them to understand what was normal, what was peculiar, what was um, uh, common, what was not common, effectively. And it took another while before uh, it was really understood what we were looking at, because most of the spectral lines that you see, so most of these dark lines that you see in the sun are from iron. And this was very quickly uh, identified when people understood what were the fingerprints of iron. And they thought that the sun, like the earth, was predominantly iron. But it took someone who actually applied what was then a newfangled theory, Cecilia, Cecilia Payne Kapochkin. She applied uh, uh, quantum mechanics to her understanding of the probability of, of having an absorption line occur in a star. And she showed that the sun, as every other star, are mostly, meaning 90, 98% in the case of the sun, hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen and helium dominate the properties of a star, unlike the Earth. So they're quite different from the Earth in that way. And these are just key moments in our understanding and our building up this picture of how stars form. And as I mentioned before, Hans Bethe understood how stars actually converted, how stars had their energy, uh, were able to maintain the energy, and were able to live for the times that people were starting to realize that stars must have lived. And then in 1957, the very classic paper of Burbage, Burbage, Fowler and Hoyle, that's what you see in the bottom corner here, figured out that it was not just the fact that you were burning hydrogen and helium for energy, but also within the process of uh, evolution and mostly from the death of stars, you can create um, uh, other elements. So what we call metals. So I should warn you that whenever I say metal, I mean anything that's heavier than hydrogen or helium. And understanding how they're made in a star is uh, coming from originally from this paper. And broadly speaking, that is our understanding that we have today. It's become more sophisticated, but that is our, uh, how, we, how we understand uh, the, the properties that you have of stars. So just to show what this means in terms of the different stellar types that we were looking at before, what you see here shows then the kind of spectra that you get of these stars. And again, you can see that different types of stars, so the M star, K star, G star, et cetera, have different masses, different lifetimes, and also very different spectra. And this difference in the spectra is actually related to the temperature. So the temperature of the star is uh, actually going from, this is a very low temperature, and this is a very high temperature star. Okay? And what we know, for, no, what we actually know from experience from a lot of the Henry Draper catalog work is the fact that if you want to see absorption lines in a star, you look in this, in this range, this type of star, because they have a temperature where it is possible to detect these very narrow metal lines. So all the lines of chemical elements such as magnesium, calcium, but also if you look with higher and higher resolution, you'll see almost every chemical element if you can look over a large enough wavelength range with enough resolution. So these are the ideal stars to, st <clears throat> to study chemical evolution over time because they're very long lived and they have metal lines. And this is just because of the intrinsic temperature of the star that this is possible. Other stars that are hotter, they have all of these metal lines, they just don't show up in the spectrum. And when you get to cooler stars, like the M stars, they have too many molecules forming. So the metals are not um, um, uh, atomic, they're molecular. And then they form these very large, very broad features, which are much more difficult to interpret. Ah, oh, yes, I did draw myself a reminder that cool stars and hot stars go along that way. So when you take a spectrum of a star, you can actually see this very nice example of just a normal halo um, a giant star, a K giant. And this is a low resolution spectrum where resolution is the wavelength over the the size of the resolution element. And so this is what we would call a very low resolution spectrum for stars. But you can see you get these very strong calcium lines here and the hydrogen lines. And then there's a, there's a molecular line of, of CH here as well. And if you zoom in on this little piece of spectrum here, you get this 
more wobbly set of lines here. Right? So you can see that there are something there, but you cannot identify exactly what it is. You can only see the relatively strong H delta line. And then if you look at this smaller, yet smaller region here at much higher spectral resolution, you're resolving out all the individual lines of different chemical elements. And they're very obscure and um, unusual elements, but many of them, especially europium, which is this EU here, that is a very strong indicator of uh, um, very active processes. Usually we think that they're coming from re relatively early in the universe, probably from massive supernova, massive star supernova, but it could also be from gamma ray bursts or from neutron star mergers that you're creating these kind of heavy elements. And by looking at the relative strengths of these different elements, you can understand which kind of energetic process is likely to have dominated the chemical evolution of the gas out of which this star was formed. So if this star is 10 giga years old, then you know that all this happened in the 3.8 giga years before this star was actually formed. So you're looking at a snapshot of what was the stage of chemical evolution for this star at that time. And there's also tremendous information that you can get looking again with these very high resolution spectra. So these are again, 50, 60,000 resolution spectra. And this particular sample is going to more and more metal poor stars. So here you have an Fe over H of minus 0 0.9. So that's a relatively, that's a, that's a, a relatively metal poor star. And this Fe over H is getting lower and lower. And this is the lowest one we've ever detected. And in this particular case, this iron over hydrogen is not even a detection, it's a limit. It means we don't detect any um, iron lines. In fact, this star, it's mostly carbon lines. And this is one of the peculiarities of uh, going from metal rich down to metal poor, is that a lot of the lines get narrower and narrower until at some point you start getting more and more of these lines here, which are marked with small dots here. And these are um, carbon lines. So it's one of the things that we've noticed in the halo of the Milky Way, the most metal poor stars, so the least evolved, the stars which have very few metals have had undergone very little enrichment. They all seem to be, or a majority of them are very rich in carbon. And this is one of the mysteries of the early universe that we still haven't completely solved exactly why so many of these stars come with very high carbon. And so all this comes down to the periodic table, which is what we're looking at here. And this is a periodic table, right, with hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, etc. And with the color coding made very nicely in order to highlight the physical processes that have actually created this element. So from this table, you can also see that, of course, all of these chemical elements are made in stars, except for hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. And this means that you gain an insight into what sort of processes created these different elements by looking at ratios of different elements with each other. So you can see the importance of exploding massive stars compared with dying low mass stars, for example. Okay, So it is really giving you almost too much information. And many of these elements are very difficult to observe, and some are more easy to observe than others. So we were seeing in our spectrum, we were seeing lanthium and europium. We're seeing all these R process elements here. And then the alpha elements are sitting here, calcium, you have magnesium, sulfur, silicon, etc. So this is really where we're looking at the building blocks of everything that we know of our entire world. The universe is coming from all this processing that goes on within stars. And some people have termed this, perhaps quite rightly, because of the fingerprint that you get from all these different processes, effectively a DNA signal of what is the signature that you would expect from different physical processes coming from different types of supernova or different types of um, um, uh, energetic events that create and spread chemical elements around that then find themselves in the next generation of stars. So this is the what we have for the chemical elements that we find in the sun. So around in our local galactic neighborhood. So 4 billion years ago, when our sun formed, these were the this was the properties of the gas. All the different 
amounts of chemical elements coming from all kinds of different processes, we can see what was the history of star formation and chemical evolution in great detail before the formation of the sun. And now I'm going to tell you a bit about my favorite galaxy, which is the Sculptor Dwarf Galaxy, which is one of the faint, faint, fainter galaxies around the Milky Way, very well resolved. This is actually done with the Tololo telescope with this four meter Cerro Tololo. And you make a beautiful color magnitude diagram where you can actually see the different properties of the red giant branch, the main sequence. You can see it's an old galaxy, right? It doesn't have any young stars sitting along the main sequence. It has a horizontal branch, which is another sign of a very old population. And so you can make a very nice color magnitude diagram, star formation history um, 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 determination. And you see, this is the majority of stars formed a very long time ago, the earliest times you could form stars. And then you can take spectra of these individual stars to see what are the chemical properties that you find. And if you take very low resolution spectra, you can measure strong lines, which are often a proxy for hydrogen, for, sorry, for iron. We're looking for a very heavy element iron, which is often the way we talk about all metals being uh, basically iron. And so you can determine what is the distribution of iron abundance, so metallicity of stars in different dwarf galaxies by measuring large numbers of red giant branch stars, getting their abundances. And if you remember from the color magnitude diagram, this covers all the ages of the star formation. So even though the ages distribute themselves along the main sequence, they all lie on top of each other on the red giant branch. So you're really sampling the full history of star formation in these older galaxies. And you can also look at how the properties change with the velocity of the star. So this is showing you the systemic velocity of the system and the different colors. So the red crosses here are metal rich and the blue circles are metal poor. And you can actually see that different populations distribute themselves differently from a kinematic point of view. And the green crosses are actually non-members, right? They don't have the right velocity to be a member of this actual system. Okay. And then you can look at it with slightly higher resolution, and then you start to see different chemical elements. And um, um, uh, you can start to look in more detail at things like, for example, alpha elements. And this is a classic example of looking for the knee. So this is all the, this is a large sample of uh, abundances in the Milky Way of magnesium over iron versus iron. And the theory tells us that this knee, what you're actually seeing, this change from looking at high alpha stars to finding low alpha stars in the disk is coming from the time when supernova type type two, which occur very quickly, uh, stop being the dominant enrichment process and supernova type one balance this. Right, so then you're having some balance between supernova type one, and type two over here, because these produce alpha elements and this produces iron. So you can see that in the Milky Way, you have this sort of distribution, this knee. And then if we measure a sample in Sculptor, we see that you have quite a different distribution, but still a knee, right? So you're still seeing this knee so you're still seeing this change, this transformation between being enriched by supernova type two to having a balance between supernova type two and type one. Right? And then you can look at this for different dwarf galaxies. So green is Sculptor, blue is Fornax, the orange is, is, is Sagittarius, purple is Carina. And you can see that all, dwarf, all these small dwarf galaxies that we've looked at look quite different from the Milky Way, which is underlined. So the halo is the high alpha that you see here, and the disk is the low alpha. And basically below about a metallicity of about minus 1.5 or so, everything looks quite different in a dwarf galaxy. And one of the conclusions that you can come to from this is that you can't actually make the halo of the Milky Way out of galaxies like Sculptor or Fornax or even Sagittarius except at very early times. So this is quite interesting. And you may say these are small samples still, and we do still wait for larger survey telescopes that are going to come in the not too distant future to make this more statistically robust to really understand what we're looking at here. And then of course, you can also combine this with the color magnitude diagrams. So you can take your measurements of iron, for example, and look at how they fit on top of your color magnitude diagram. So the small dots are the model color magnitude diagram, 
and the big dots are the measurements, the spectroscopic iron abundances and where they actually lie, the closest position that they lie on the, on the red giant branch here. And then you can convert that into an actual determination of what, at what time, at what age, do these stars start to turn over in the knee and supernova type one start to play a role in the chemical enrichment of the galaxy. And the gray points are again the Milky Way. And from this work, you can actually measure that chemical enrichment of the dwarf seroidal sculpture dwarf seroidal galaxy with supernova type one products began after about two to three giga years of the first supernova type two explosion. So again, powerful thing you can look at. Another thing you can look at in, uh, in dwarf galaxies is, for example, carbon. I said earlier in the talk that carbon is very enhanced in the most metal poor stars that you have in the Milky Way. So this plot shows you for iron versus carbon, which is the same as this plot, the black squares here are from the Milky Way. So the halo of the Milky Way, a very large fraction of the most metal poor stars are below about minus four, minus three. They are enriched, very much enriched in carbon. But when you look at the, at the dwarf galaxies, the dwarf seroidal galaxies, that doesn't seem to be the case. But if you look at more fainter dwarf galaxies, the ultra faint dwarf galaxies, then it does seem to be the case. So it's a bit mysterious why, for example, in sculpture, now we've looked quite a lot, we don't see any sign of this super enhancement that you see here of carbon in the most metal poor stars. And the statistics are such that we only find actually one carbon enhanced, one truly carbon enhanced star, and it's only barely carbon enhanced in sculpture, and it's not in the position that they normally are in the halo of the Milky Way. So this is again another difference with what you're actually seeing in the Milky Way compared with a dwarf, compared with a dwarf uh, seroidal galaxy. So what was happening here in the past in these very metal poor stars in the dwarf spheroidal galaxies looks very different from what was happening in the Milky Way, also for carbon. But I should also say that there's a huge variety of properties that you find when you start looking in detail at these very small galaxies. And Sculptor is quite a large dwarf galaxy among the very small samples. So it's one of the classical dwarf galaxies. And recently, over the last 20 years, incredibly faint dwarfs have been found with very low masses. So this, this, this galaxy has 10,000 masses of the sun. It's very small. This is an incredibly small galaxy. And you can see that the number of stars for which you can actually take spectra on the red giant branch is extremely small. And when they look at alpha elements, for example, these are all high, comparable with a halo. So it looks sort of normal. It's the red points you have to look at. And the brown and the blue points are just coming from other galaxies. So showing that you see a scatter, but broadly speaking in alpha elements, this galaxy looks quite normal. But where it does not look normal is when you look at europium, which is an R process element, which usually comes from a very violent, uh, very explosive supernova or perhaps neutron star mergers that created gravitational wave signatures that we see then you, you see all these different stars. And in the Milky Way halo, there are these kind of um, European rich stars at the faint points here, but they're extremely rare in the Milky Way. And the Milky Way halo is huge. And here you have one tiny little galaxy where almost all the stars you observe have this enrichment in this R process element, which is very peculiar. And again, this is not completely well understood, but it's showing you that what's happening within the local group is very, inhomogeneous. It doesn't really follow any kind of pattern that um, makes a clear picture, a clear simple picture um, obvious yet, I would say. I haven't had much time to talk about Gaia, which is starting to have a huge effect on our understanding mostly of objects closer to the Milky Way. So this is a beautiful picture from Rodrigo Ibata and collaborators showing streams that you can pick out when you look very closely at the motions of stars on the sky, you can see coherent motions of these relatively small samples of stars. And you see these coherent structures all through the halo of the Milky Way, which does seem rather in contrast to what I was just saying, saying that you know, the Milky Way is not made up of mergers. I should say these are very small samples and these are mostly globular clusters, what you're seeing here. 
but still, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of a mystery still. And I think we have to wait for larger samples to really get a handle on how complex this process has been and what a lot of these objects are and what their chemistry is compared with the Milky Way. And by we now have this combination of chemistry, ages, and the positions and motion and the coherent structures and trying to put this all together will doubtless be very revealing about what's exactly been happening uh, in the halo of the Milky Way, which is a tiny fraction of the Milky Way. By far, most of the stars in the Milky Way are in the disk, in this huge disk here, which is a much more evolved structure and is currently forming stars, as we know today. So it's much more complicated. This is just highlighting this, this structure here, which is the Omega Sen, which is actually the, the, the object I showed, we zoomed into at the very beginning of this talk. And it is clearly having tidal streams. It's clearly something that fell into the Milky Way and has been interacting and losing a lot of stars as it's coming in. So there's, there's, a, there's a treasure trove of, of things that can pop out from looking at the Milky Way closely. And I think this is my final example where I just show another example of potentially a dwarf galaxy in the Milky Way halo that was originally highlighted by Nissen and Schuster in 2010 using extremely high and uh, signal to noise and spectra resolution spectra um, to understand, to, to look at in detail at the alpha element properties we're looking at here. And they found this small difference between high alpha and low alpha stars, which they could only see. This is a tiny difference. It's really within the errors because they had such low errors, they could actually see this shift. And they also noticed from the very old astrometric satellite Hipparchus, that they were falling in a slightly different place, these low alpha stars compared with the high alpha stars. This was always intriguing. It couldn't be taken further. There's not enough data. It was just something that was, that was left there. But now with Gaia DR2, this has been shown to be, you know, with a much larger sample, very strong result that you're actually seeing a very clear, very high, um, uh, um, um, very secure that what you're actually looking at is a different structure that's not uniform like what you're seeing of the rest of the, of the Milky Way. And what you're seeing is this is in the, the velocities that you get in the X, Y, and Z direction. So three-dimensional velocities that you can actually look at and see how stars are moving within the Milky Way. And these stars are also found in a color magnitude diagram because again, what Gaia gives you is the ability to determine the distance to a star from parallaxes. And you can see that in this color magnitude diagram of the halo, you see these two sequences, which is two different populations with two different ages. Okay. And they did some analysis looking at, at isochromes and you can see the different ages that you have of these populations. So you're really looking at something that has merged with the halo of the Milky Way at some point in the past. It's not that hugely different from the metallicity of the halo, but it's, it's, it's significant, you can see it in there. And there's also been a lot of abundances of this structure just by chance uh, from Apogee. So looking again at alpha elements and they, these, element, these, these abundances are not so accurate as those of Nissen and Schuster, but there are much many more of them. And you can see that there is a structure that's much more that's alpha poor compared with the classical halo above or thick disc, which is more alpha rich. And this is reminiscent also of Apogee results showing something like the Large Magellanic Cloud fits into this region here. So it looks like an object, something like the size of the Magellanic Cloud, Large Magellanic Cloud, merged with the halo of the Milky Way. And we see it in a very local volume because the Gaia is very local. We see it back as another dwarf spheroidal that has been merged with the halo of the Milky Way. And this again is something that we really can look forward to in uh, further understanding with more data as it comes along. Okay, so this is my summary slide. So showing just an overview of what I have told you about. So we take our individual stars, we can take their colors and their magnitudes and make a color magnitude diagram and determine the star formation history that you see. So when did start, when did, were all the stars formed in a given galaxy? We can also take an individual star and make a spectrum and determine the chemical properties that have occurred over the same sort of time scale. And then you can measure exactly how alpha elements have varied with time 
in different places and uh, different galaxies and see if you're building up a coherent picture. And I, again, make the same analogy that I made all the way through is that when you're looking at color magnitude diagrams, you're looking at geological strata. So you're figuring out where your fossil may be. And here, you're looking at individual stars, which you're placing in the strata and looking at the chemical properties to understand the DNA of what you're looking at. Okay, so this is where I end now with where will the fossil footprints lead next? Uh, what, what will the future bring? I think we're going to have many exciting options with Gaia with, um, uh, and also with Formos, which is going to be a multi-object spectrograph going on, uh, on one of the telescopes near the, near the VLT in Paranal. And these are going to make a huge impact in our understanding of the Milky Way by measuring so many abundances, so many velocities, linking to Gaia with the proper motions. This is going to be a very exciting time for this kind of research to understand much better the Milky Way. Thank you, Aline. Wonderful, beautiful, beautiful overview. This is a very fascinating topic and, and field with an extremely promising future. So I want to ask my first question. Um, you pointed out, uh, you know, many different, let's say, mosaic pieces of this um, this framework of enrichment and star formation history, and it seems to me always, you know, where I'm coming from, right? From globular cluster studies, right? We're studying supposedly simple stellar populations, but they are not that simple in the end. Um, that we sort of use tools that are not tuned to the highest, let's say, signal to noise of our evidence that we're seeking in reconstructing these star formation histories. So have you thought about how to approach this in the future? Do, do, would you go rather to high redshift, study, let's say, objects that are technically you know, younger, simpler, in the field or improve our tools and just veer out a little bit out of the local volume and decipher more precisely the chemical enrichment history and the chemical composition and how these systems have assembled and, and formed their stars in the first place. So I'm thinking a little bit along along the lines of, you know, this, this different seeds, right? Mm -hmm. This different um, methods of element generation and injection into the stellar mm -hmm. populations that you observe them in the end? No, it's, it's certainly, I mean, it's very challenging, I agree. And globular clusters, you have the advantage where you can look with such high uh, signal to noise and high spectral resolution. You have fantastic data in the field. And all you did is make a mess in some sense by making it more confusing because you suddenly you, you end up with these anomalies that really don't make sense. And you've observed them everywhere and they're so strong that there's no way to really find your way out of it as some kind of statistical argument, or let's put that on one side. It becomes a real problem that you have to solve. But I still think that precision work is really what's needed. And I worry that the further away you go, the more difficult it is to really have the precision, just because you're, you're, not, you're either not going to get the signal to noise or you're not going to get the resolution. Um, I know Soren has different opinions about this and he does very nice work going a little bit further away. And I, I do understand that globular clusters are a good place to look. And because you're looking, you know you're looking at a roughly uniform population. So you, you, can, you can make them, I think you do a better job than if you look at a galaxy all put together because a galaxy may have really big differences in ages and metallicities. And in globular clusters, you have small ones, but I think they're, for, for what I'm talking about, we're talking about for the evolution of the system, unless you're trying to explain a very subtle point. Um, uh, that's a good idea. But I, I, I think, I personally think that work that really pays attention to the details will solve the problem. Because a lot of previous work, it's not that people were doing it badly, it's just that that's the data that they had. And there was many data where the scatter was very large, just because measurement techniques were not so good. And, and I also noticed, I mean, I talked about these things, I have to say, I admit in a very old fashioned way, and I see young people these days coming up with all these very fancy um, MCMC uh, solutions for minimizing problems and understanding really to identify where are the points where you're seeing differences. Because a lot of times in these stars, uh, you see very similar behaviors, and then you see one element that's different, for example, or something like this. So it's, 
picking out where the importances are and, and what is really significant requires good data because otherwise you may be picking out uh, an observational effect. Uh, and that would, that's really something you want to avoid. I think if you want to move forward in, in a field. I mean, you have these days, I think, enough of knowledge of, let's say, being able to construct forward, right? Forward propagation of sure. in processes. And so with that knowledge, right, the prior functions are, let's say, narrower than, than a flat prior mm -hmm. in certain aspects. Sure, absolutely. So design, right, spectrographs and filters precisely to, to mm -hmm. tune, tune them to these questions. People are doing that. I mean, there's the pristine survey, for example, which has very specific designs of filters to find very metal poor stars. And it's been very successful in doing that. And that's not by, by any means the only one. That's just a recent example that comes to my head from one of my colleagues. But uh, people have been doing this for a long time. And there you get large samples with very specific information. But I'm, my, my interest is going more and more to very high resolution spectroscopy. You get a wealth of detail, and I'm not, I don't guarantee you'll explain anything, but you'll have a lot of information. I've often found it quite interesting that we live on, on the planet Earth, and we know less about the center of the Earth than we know about the farthest reaches of the cosmos, because we have a lot more information. So you're making something complicated, understandable when you have so much information is, is not easy. Do you... Um want to hand over to Søren maybe at this point? Søren, do you have sure. insights? Ah. <laughs> yes, I, I was not going to ask something about globular clusters actually, but um, uh, you mentioned many examples in your talk, Elena, about the discoveries that came about more or less by chance, or at least not by sort of a straight line of inquiry, like the HR diagram mm -hmm. is one thing. Mm -hmm. They didn't really understand what they were looking at. Mm -hmm. You can say something similar about the stellar classification. Uh, something similar about the Fraunhofer lines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so what are your thoughts on the way that, that we should conduct our scientific inquiry? What is the, what is the right balance of just doing you know, pure curiosity driven research, you know, doing something because we can do something and then see where it leads yep. versus uh, asking more specific questions and trying to answer them and, uh, and what are the you know, implications for the way that we, that we design our facilities that we use to design these questions and, mm. and, and the observing programs that we conduct there? Yeah, it's obviously a balance. And uh, I, I mean, we would all love the freedom just to explore away in our own little corner. And I think if you look back into history, you see these times when it worked really well. But of course, many people did things that didn't work out. And, you know, like Newton, if you look at most of his time, he spent on alchemy, for example. So people go in all kinds of weird directions. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I completely agree that being free to follow your curiosity without having a model that you have to fit to or a preconceived idea of what you're looking for is, is absolutely uh, vital when you don't know where you're going, when you have a problem that doesn't seem to be solved in a very traditional way. And we have a number of them in astronomy like this. But I also sometimes see that some problems are so complex that if you're a bit too scattershot about how you approach it, you run the risk that you're not going to understand anything because you're not doing things in a methodical way. And sometimes you need, and if you really want a lot of telescope time, unfortunately, they won't give it to you um, without you having a very clear plan and well thought out vision for what you're doing and why you're doing it. And perhaps that's not incorrect. But I do agree that uh, we should be more open to more uh, exploratory programs. And like I've seen also with the last talk I saw of yours, I mean, you know, your beautiful is it nature paper or science paper on the very metal poor globular cluster around M31. That was just something you had extra time at the telescope, you said. So that's an example of just a, a random process by which you find something. And if you take that away completely from observations, you're going to lose these kind of opportunities and you may miss things that, that, that you absolutely should not. So I do see, I completely agree that there should be a, a large place for non-planned research whenever you're looking into anything particular. It used to be, I mean, one of the things I miss with the service mode and even the way ESO is very strict with the, what you can observe when you're on the mountain, you miss a little bit this opportunity that we always had historically of some extra time here or there that you experiment with. It's absolutely important, I think. 
I don't know what your thoughts are about that. Yes, I think that is important, right? But obviously, as you say, there has to be a balance, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just a, a free for all, huh? but I mean, unfortunately, different, <laughs> different observatories <laughs> also handle this in different ways, right? So, yeah, so the, uh, I mean, at ESO, this is very difficult uh, to do these kind of mm -hmm. spontaneous uh, things, right? Uh, on Paranal, if you go there, you have to, you know, ask for waivers to to deviate from your planned observing yeah. programs, like uh, this paper that you referred to, you know. Just came out uh, uh, out out of a Keck observing run because we had like an hour to fill, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, what do we do now? Okay, let's observe this cluster, right? And and then it turns out to be interesting, and, and that, mm -hmm. that has advantages as well. Yeah, yep, definitely. Okay, next question is from Paul. Paul, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very nice talk. So if we look at isochrones in in the dwarf galaxies and local group, we know that the star formation history is for every dwarf is, is very unique, right? So all mm -hmm. they all show different star formation histories. And um, if we go, for example, to larger distances to clusters, and we're just looking at colors because we cannot resolve them, um, we see that the, the galaxies seem to be very uniform, right? Have a uniform color. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, how can we, or how can you explain the, the very different star formation histories in the local group? And should we expect also, <clears throat> a very, uh, how to say, uh, a different star formation history for all these uh, dwarf galaxies that we find in more distant clusters where we cannot resolve them because they're too far away. So. I would think probably there would be. I think a lot of times when people are doing even integrated light is they're not going to as faint dwarf galaxies as most of the ones I've been talking about. I mean, they are very faint. They're very, they're, they're, they're very numerous, but they're extremely numerous, but they're all very different. And you may want to, I, I think the best way of attributing that is stochasticity. So when you have a small system, it can go in any particular direction. It's very sensitive to um, any kind of uh, process that sends it in one direction or another. So if it forms a massive star by chance, very beginning, it'll have a different history than maybe a, a galaxy that forms its first massive star a little bit later. And I think when you look at bigger galaxies, which is typically what you do when you go further away, but it's also true if you look at the Milky Way, the disk is very uniform in some sense, in the sense that it's, you know, it, everything averages out. So if you look at, you know, our, our local group, our, sorry, our local neighborhood compared with a piece a little bit further away, it's not so different in terms of the star formation history. So I think in small galaxies, stochasticity plays a huge role. And I think when you have a big galaxy, it all merges together. So you're probably getting all of this. You're just not resolving it. And then it all averages together and you lose a little bit of this detail, which is again, one of the reasons I think it's very useful to look at the detail that we can only get in the local group and realize that it must be part of everything that you're seeing in a larger galaxy, just on a larger scale. Okay, then we go to Kathy. Hi, Eileen. Thanks Hi. for the talk. It was very nice. So you made the case that uh, the sculptured galaxy, which, by the way, is one of my favorite objects to <laughs> the sky, um, so it does not have the chemical enrichment compatible with halo stars. And probably then uh, galaxies like Sculptor did not form the Milky Way, did not form most of the, of the halo of the mm -hmm. Milky Way. Mm -hmm. So what kind of galaxies? What's, what's your view uh, with the data at hand now? What kind of galaxies form the Milky Way? Um, yeah, I, so I, like to be her I like to be heretical and say that uh, they, formed, they formed in situ, maybe. I mean, it's possible that it really formed. It didn't have to be a merger. You don't need to have necessarily a merger to explain what you see at the current moment. Because I find a lot of times when you look at very uniform surveys of, for example, halo stars in the Milky Way. So I'm thinking of the Carell uh, survey of uh, very metal, me relatively metal poor stars. They've got incredibly uniform properties. So either we're looking locally or in such a small region that things are not that different in some sense, or uh, maybe um, uh, we're not looking at the full picture, it's possible. So I'm a bit, I like to be, it's a bit provocative to take this point of view, because of course, as Gaia is coming and showing us all these streams and all these different objects, many people are saying that it's entirely built out of different types of galaxies. 
because given the fact that you see there's such a variety of dwarf galaxies, you may say that larger galaxies are actually going to, larger dwarf galaxies are going to make up the majority of what you see. And that's, that's what may be what we're seeing with the Gaia Enceladus. I don't think I actually gave it a name, but the Nissan and Schuster uh, um, and the Gaia, Gaia Enceladus system is potentially, I mean, my colleague would explain the whole halo in, these, in terms of this object. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's so clear cut yet. And I think we should always be open not to go down the path that seems the most easy path, which is to say that it's all made up of, of, of mergers of small galaxies, because the current circumstance doesn't seem to fit very well for a number of reasons. That's not to say that better data in the future won't change it. I, I'm happy to change my mind always about most things, but uh, it's something that is still a little bit uh, open, I would say exactly what we're looking at. I should also point out that the halo of the Milky Way is an incredibly small fraction of the total Milky Way. So yeah. in some sense, it doesn't say very much about the history of our galaxy. In some sense. So if we find that the whole halo is one merger or the whole halo is one in situ formation, it doesn't make much difference to our understanding of the Milky Way, I have to say. If you really want to know what's been happening with the Milky Way, I think you have to look at the disk, which is really difficult because it's so big. So following up on this, if 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 I may, um, uh, what's your, what kind of observations do we need in the future, and and what uh, plan, instrument or telescope that is being built or is being in plans, are is getting excited? Uh, is is it excites you that that you think we are going to get an answer from it? Well, I really think the combination of Gaia and these large spectroscopic surveys with relatively high, high spectral resolution. So I'm very enthusiastic about Formos, and then there's Weef in the north, and they have a, they have a setting where they can look with 20,000 resolution uh, uh, spectroscopy of many, many targets in one go. And I think by chemical tagging, as it's often called, you will build up a much better picture of how many anomalies there are. And also the fact you're going to analyze the data in a very uniform way, I think. Hopefully, that's the hope, because uh, the whole way it's being set up, especially foremost, is to process the data, but also we is to process the data in a very uniform way. And then I think you'll have a much better picture of a much larger, more uniform sample of stars and their chemistry, because I think what's lacking up till now of many of these surveys is very accurate chemistry. So there are some surveys which like Apogee is a wonderful survey. I worry a bit about its accuracy as you get into lower metallicities. So when you're really looking at the halo or even the thick disc, it's so I, I want to see the accuracy and I want to see the large numbers of well understood lines. And then I hope that we have enough information that we're understanding what we're looking at, which I agree is a risk. We may end up not understanding anything, but I think there's still not a reason not to try. It's, uh, That's right. Thank you. Okay, before we go on with other questions from the panelists, uh, we have one from Jim Peebles in the Q&A. So I would like to read this one, yeah. So it says, to check, I think you are saying that the Milky Way halo contains remnants of objects similar to the observed Milky Way companion, but that most of the Milky Way halo stars are different from the nearby dwarf? Yes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but I would not necessarily say that the halo is made up of companions. I would say that it's not really clear because I think when you look at the detailed properties of the galaxies that we can measure in detail around the Milky Way, I would argue that most of them are a little bit too different or too small to really make up majority of the halo. So I think if you want to imagine that the halo is made up by a, a merger, it would be a larger object, something like a Magellanic cloud size object would probably dominate the stellar population. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to say something about globular clusters also playing a role because clearly there are globular clusters floating around the, in the halo as well. So. But they have their particular weirdness as well, right? They do, they do. So it I is don't know if- a Very yeah. interesting question by Jim because it means that there is sort of either a dynamical or a chemical evolution puddle, right? Or, or dichotomy of some sort that makes mm -hmm the halo and then the rest has not been processed yet mm. which is i don't know how unique this is maybe mike has some deeper insight on mm. 
on structure formation processes here. No, we haven't heard from the theorists yet. So. <laughs> Should we go to Mike? Oh, thanks. And thanks for the lovely overview. Um, I was, you know, I think you, you made a very convincing case that looking at the details in the Milky Way has really been an extremely powerful path to understanding um, aspects of galaxy formation there. I'm sort of wondering what your perspective is in the future when we have the ability to look in a similarly detailed way, significantly further away from the Milky Way itself. There, do you think, and I think this touches on what you were just talking about, you know, if we can see the M81 group in great detail or other nearby groups, is that really where we'll gain a lot of information about the cosmological context, or is it still going to be in the, in the Milky Way with these big surveys plus, um, you know, proper motions, chemistry, things like that. I, I do agree that we have a very local bubble in some sense that we're making all these uh, extrapolations about them. It's a very small uh, box in the universe. That's certainly true. So I'm sure pushing out further away when we can do it with reasonable accuracy. I think I will be more optimistic about that after some of these large Milky Way surveys have completed some fraction of, of what they plan to do, because then you'll have a picture, I think, that you can compare with when you see something further away. Because I think in M81, for example, it's going to be challenging to have the same quality of data you can get from the Milky Way, obviously. So I think you're going to want to ask a specific question to say, can we see uh, differences that we see in the Milky Way in a more distant system? And then I think you know what kind of experiment you need to, uh, to design which may be very expensive in time, but if you target it, if you want to say, I, this is what we see in the Milky Way, can we see the same effect? And people have already been doing this. I mean, a lot of times you do not need to have integrated light, for example, uh, to have individual stars to see um, mergers around in the halos of other galaxies. So you can count the number of mergers that you see almost better when you're looking further away. Although of course you're then mostly sensitive to the high, uh, the high surface brightness ones, so the more massive mergers. So there are things, of course, you can do, and people do looking at, uh, at more at external systems, but it's just a different way you're looking at it. I think the advantage of being in the middle of the Milky Way is being able to have this kind of accuracy, which it's going to always be unique, I think. But I like details. <laughs> okay, let's go to Jacqueline next. Yeah, thank you, Eileen, for a Hi. great talk. So I actually... I was very much with Cathy's and Jim's question. I was really surprised to hear you say many times that <laughs> the halo is not formed out of force. But then you said something I was even more surprised about, that you say, if you figure out how the halo is formed, we haven't learned that much. Are you it depends on learn that much in what sense. Learn that much about the Milky Way, perhaps yeah, not. So um, mm -hmm. I saw not all galaxies have halos, do they? Or do that. I think we don't know that often because you it really need that. to. Uh, so I, I think most times people look, they find one, but I'm not sure about that. But. Okay, so that I don't know the answer to that either. Yeah. But um, will there be a way to rule out that the halo is formed by a merger? Well, I think a lot of these surveys will uh, come to a conclusion one way or the other. Because when you have the chemistry, and for example, if all the chemistry gives a uniform picture, you tend to think of it as a unified object in some sense. Whereas if you see you know, things that don't make sense from a, from a chemical evolution point of view, so a mixture of metal rich and metal poor and lots of different knees in different places and a big scatter. So historically, people have always interpreted scatter as a sign of a random process. So if you have lots of different uh, uh, alpha element abundances, for example, at a given iron, that suggests that you had many different inputs. It was not a uniform process. And that is much more likely to be merging. So I think you can come out with a fairly definitive okay. answer once you've done a large survey, I think you can. What you've learned about the Milky Way remains another question. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe Jim Peoples is the one to ask about <laughs> what, <laughs> how important actually it is to understand the halo in order to, uh, to really understand what's going on in the Milky Way. It's certainly a component, and it's clearly a component where we can trace these very ancient events. But people are finding more and more very metal poor stars also in the bulge, for example, or 
Uh, I haven't seen them in the disk yet, but some of the bulge surveys, they're starting to find more and more metal poor stars. So we know they're there, they're just very rare. But in the halo, you're just obviously seeing yeah. almost just a, 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 such a sparse population that uh, has a lot of very metal poor stars. And But people have also looked for these metal poor stars in the halo because it's easier to look there. They're looking at high velocity stars, very high up in the, in the high above the plane. And, uh, yeah. Okay. I'll be patient. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so now we go to Mario. Hi, thank you very much for such a nice uh, talk. Um, it's also related to Cathy and Jim's question. Um, probably you have heard it many times, the argument, and I would like to hear what is your opinion that the, it's not really a very fair comparison to compare the stellar halo with the satellites because the, the stellar halo is made of early, or debris from the early satellites mm -hmm. of the Milky Way, and you are comparing with the present day satellites that could be very different. Well, I would give the argument that Sculptor, for example, stopped forming stars really eight to 10 giga years ago. So Sculptor has not changed very much in recent times. So, and the fact it doesn't look like the halo means that that argument is not, not necessarily okay when you have the information to be able to select the right age range. So Sculptor doesn't look like the halo and it was around at the right time. But also I should say, I was very specific. It doesn't look like, you know, you have, you could merge Sculptor with the halo and create the halo if it merged before Sculptor had its knee at the wrong position. So mm -hmm. two giga years, in the first two giga years of star formation in both Sculptor, in Sculptor, sorry, then uh, you can actually form the halo of the Milky Way from that to first order. But then I go one step further and say, we're also missing carbon rich stars, for example. There's certain types of RR Lyrae which are not found in dwarf galaxies, but are found in the halo. And so there are certain indicators that don't make it a trivial process to really merge even the ancient populations of nearby dwarf galaxies to make the halo. So it's, I, I'm not saying that this is the final answer. It's of course a relevant point, but when you're able to pick out the old stars, you are able also to say at this point, you could merge this and create something that looks like the halo. And there are a lot of halo-like stars in Sculptor, but that doesn't, but you have to have such a narrow window when you would actually merge it, that it starts to become a little bit contrived, I think. But this is me a little bit being a little bit heretical and provocative. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so Anna, we ask next question. Um, hello, thanks Hi. for a very nice talk. Um, yes, you mentioned so, that Sculptor was your favorite dwarf galaxy. It's not my favorite, but <laughs> I'll let that get in the way. It's good um, to have differences. <laughs> Um, so I'm of course familiar with your work on um, multiple metallicity populations in Sculptor, and to the best of your knowledge, what do you think would be the origin of the two metallicity populations, and what do you think the history of Sculptor has been? Well, I always try, uh, try to avoid difficult questions by saying I'm an observer, I see what it is, and then I, I leave it to the theorists to uh, to make to have fun with that. I mean. I guess a simple interpretation would be smaller objects merging. That would potentially be a simple interpretation that I think many people would probably put forward. Again, it can possibly be something about what happened in the earliest times in Sculptor that it got a, it had a, it, it, it had a, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a merger. It can be something that dynamically uh, uh, stirred it at some early point uh, between different episodes of star formation. I don't know, honestly. It's uh, it's a bit it's a very confusing uh, uh, result in some sense, and it gets it's. I've looked now at the Gaia data as well, and it's very solid result. It's just becoming more solid in some sense when you look with more detail, which is sometimes surprising about these these kinds of results. So yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Do you have an idea? Um, I have a paper on it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I will look for it. What is your what is your what is the answer you think um for a dwarf of uh the size of sculptor it it would probably be a merger at some very okay. early time 
Okay. Um, that would be my so mini halos, something like this, mini halos merging. Um, maybe a smaller minor merger, just uh, spreading like middle four stars around. Um, okay. I think um, another thing that would be quite interesting is looking for very metal four stars uh, in the outer halo, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm not completely sure how um, how far the observations have gone out in Sculptor, but it would mm -hmm. be um, nice to see some very metal ball stars further out, which would support that merger scenario. We had looked quite strongly for metal ball stars in the outskirts, and uh, it's it's always difficult. It's always difficult, but it's become a bit easier with Gaia because Gaia actually allows you to pick out what are likely members. So I have had observing runs recently where hopefully I can maybe say something a bit more about this, but I don't think there's something dramatic. It's not like suddenly you get a large number of metal ball stars in the outskirts. But what I can say is that the, the differences between the populations are definitely there. So there are these two populations which have quite interesting differences. But and again, if you look at Carina, you also see differences in the populations. So it's it's not an unusual thing. I don't know whether Carina would also be a merger in your estimation or um, not completely sure about Carina. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's also important to make that distinction between something that is actually two very distinct populations and something that might just be a metallistic gradient. Mm -hmm. But Carina actually has these multiple turnoffs where the sculptor metallistic gradient, meh, I don't know, could be. But Carina is really clear with these, uh, with these turnoffs that are so distinct, meaning star formation really went very low and then turned on again. And then, so it's, so I think the metallicity between the population difference is not so strong and the spatial difference is not strong, but the age gap is very real. So it's mm -hmm. a different, yeah. Well, we've also looked uh, at the possibility of reigniting star formation as um, a dwarf gets. Um, um, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that's also a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's possible too. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's something I should have thought of, yeah. <laughs> Related to this a little bit, is there any relation of the low metallicity floor versus the, let's say, baryonic mass of dwarfs in a local volume? In which sense? So you would expect? For the flimsier objects to be, well, technically you would expect lower metallicity floors. Mm. Well, I think they have lower average metallicity, but I think the floor is it's quite similar everywhere in the sense it's very hard to find many stars below minus four also in the halo of the Milky Way. I mean, we have five or something like this. I don't know. It's very, not even perhaps. Well, there, is, there is the problem of, of uh, chemical variance then at some point, right? Because you're mm. floating in the halo of a larger, larger yeah. halo, right? And then sure. you get a little whiff of a supernova. And mm -hmm. I think that's what, they, what the most common explanation is for a reticulum is that it must have come from somewhere outside the galaxy because it's completely incompatible with the size of the galaxy itself. So. Let me actually get into the Q&A because there is a related question at the top of the Q&A uh, mm -hmm. from Sandeepan Saho, uh, who's asking what are the current theories trying to explain why, and he says younger stars are carbon rich, but I think he means more metal poor, the ultra metal poor mm -hmm. stars are carbon rich. So where does mm -hmm. the carbon enhancement likely come from? Yeah, that's like I said, it's a mystery. It's a, uh, it's one of those things that I think again, various people have got various explanations for, but I don't think there's a there's a consensus about exactly what it is. Pe what 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 people have done is they've created models of supernova that are a bit peculiar in the very early universe, and they can create a model in such a way that it does produce a lot of carbon, and then you could imagine that this supernova is unusual, and occurs only in the very early universe. We have the freedom to do that because then it just, you know, creates the enrichment very early on, and then it's then it's lost after that. You don't see that kind of supernova in the modern day universe, which is why we don't exactly know what it is. But modelers can make a way of uh, creating a large amount of carbon in certain types of supernova. That's a possibility, and then you may say that in a dwarf galaxy, you have less chance that you would have a peculiar object like this would have to be so it's either it's, I think most of the time they assume it's quite massive and I think on the whole the dwarf galaxies have such small stellar masses that the 
It's not that the IMF is different. It's just when you sample an IMF, the probability that you're going to get a very massive star is much lower at any given time. So there is another uh, thing going on in the Q&A window. There is a debate between Jim Peebles and Pavel Krupa going on. <laughs> Jim is asking okay, good luck with that. <laughs> Uh, he's saying, and formation in C2 fits the thin disk of the Milky Way? Who says this? That... Jim. Jim. Yes, definitely. That's no. not, not because Jim asked the question, I was just trying <laughs> to think. But it... <laughs> no. no, no, it does. It's, um, uh, the thin disk is clearly something that formed in situ, and everything is consistent with that. It has a very uniform properties and uniform enrichment. And, I think there was a, in the in the thin disk of the Milky Way, you do have these complications of migration of stars going uh, in and out uh, uh, from the disk, and and I'm sure that you need some kind of uh, enrichment process because you have, for example, the G dwarf problem. It's not solved by having effectively a closed box, so we do know that material comes into the disk. Otherwise, you don't. But it's still it's something that's in situ, it's something that's not uh, requiring mergers. And in fact, I think you destroy a disk quite easily with a merger if you're not careful. So. Okay, um, so let's wrap this up here. Thank you, Eileen. This was a wonderful talk, beautiful overview. And, and again, the, the future is extremely bright for this field. So I hope so. Yeah. Thank minute. you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be here exciting results yeah so thank you to the panelists also for being here for your time thank you thank you <laughs> so thank you audience for tuning in um please be so kind fill out the survey again um, after the talk is done and our next talk in the golden webinar series will be given by alan dressler next week on march 12th uh, alan is an emeritus astronomer at carnegie institution for science in washington dc and his talk will be about exploring origins and seeing the birth of galaxies with the james webb space telescope so quite related to the talk today mm -hmm. so uh, i'll have to tune in <laughs> exactly so thank you very much again everyone stay safe stay healthy until the next golden webinar in astrophysics next week bye everyone thank you bye bye Thank you.